Productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. Brothers Coffee has been producing Greenfield coffee in Greenfield for a while now and have just moved their operations from Hope Street out to the industrial park. I am going to miss that. So we are really lucky that they are here to speak to us at this time because this just happened. I was, <laughs> I was trying to talk, to talk to people for setting these up. Well, we're moving. <laughs> so It's been busy. It's well, been busy. Thank, thank you, you so much yeah, for taking love the time this library. to do this. No, thank like, you. My pleasure. Thank you. You know we're here all the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's an odd thing we don't have pierces floating through. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, me and my brother started our business back in 1993. That's when we became incorporated. We were really young, and um, at the time, you could. When we graduated from school, people would send you credit card things all the time. We kept getting these credit card things, credit card things. And I was living in California, collecting these credit card things. And Sean was here laying the groundwork for an LLC. And we were thinking of doing a bagel shop. And we were thinking of doing a burrito shop. And um, my best friend was a baker. And he said, bagels are boiled. And I said, wow, I didn't know that. I probably shouldn't start a bagel shop because it seemed pretty Pretty, um, seems like a big part of the process. So um, at the time, I met a guy who was uh, in, in one of my restaurants who was working for a company called Cafe Trias at the time. And um, he really took us under our, his wing. And, and um, at the time, we started selling his coffee on the, on the East Coast. Um, coffee hadn't really taken off yet. And we both grew up in the restaurant business. Our dad had a restaurant in Springfield for a very, very short amount of time. And my sister, oldest sister Michelle, led the way by waiting tables. So my first job was washing dishes, and then I was a prep cook, and then I was a line cook, and then I was a busboy, and then I was a waiter, and then I was a bartender in that order. So I ended up in California after school um, bartending. and. Uh, and like I said, me and my brother always wanted to start a business together. We just didn't know what it was. Um, Sean was working with social services in Boston at the time, and he was running a house called Mikasa, which was uh, for um, um, troubled youths that were, it was one step either into a juvenile program or one step out of a ju juvenile program. Um, and he got burnt out by that. It was just, you know, it was sleepovers, long hours. He was living in Amherst and he would drive to work and work like 48 hours straight and then drive back. So he was constantly running around like that. Um, and 
Yeah. And so, um, so that was it. We, we discovered coffee and it was amazing because we grew up in a uh, household where they had Sanka and Cremate and if anyone came over, they'd be like, sure, we have coffee. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's really what our experience was. And then my first job at a place called Collation, Wren County, was my first training on an espresso maker. And it was like so crazily hard to grasp at the time. It's just so funny that my life has taken me that way because it was something, I don't drink milk unless it's chocolate milk or in cereal. So it's nothing that I, I was really, I, I love espresso, but I wasn't drinking cappuccinos or lattes. So it was, a, it was a learning curve, the guy who cooks and doesn't eat meat kind of thing. But, um, so, and so in 1994, we came back, we started peddling coffee. Uh, the funny thing is our first business plan was just like, oh, we'll get an account and we'll buy a piece of machine for $100 and then we'll be off to the races. And like every single restaurant that we ever had worked at, we went to them and they were just like, hmm, espresso. So I'm gonna spend $8,000 on a coffee maker and I'm gonna make my money back out. So it was really sort of, dead in the water. And the other thing was we were kept pushing, you know, great cup of coffee to finish your meal. And back in the, you know, early nineties, a lot of people were like, I don't want them sticking around. I want them out of here. So I really don't want a good cup of coffee. So we were fighting an uphill battle at the time and people thought we were sort of crazy. Well, that was education. Cause again, you talk about Sank, I mean, there really wasn't, gourmet coffee didn't exist until, you know, a lot of stuff, for most of it comes from the West Coast and works its way this way or from New York up. And um, so at the time, you mentioned I was in human service. I was in Boston for 10 or plus years. For programs. Um, got, you know, got to a point where I was burnt out and wasn't there for the right reasons anymore. So we decided we were still young enough. We could do something. We always talked about, I might be covering the same territory again, but we want to do something um, I think he said Honduras. different. And uh, our whole life was pretty much restaurant business. So he was in the, he was in the field at the time. I'd been out myself through college. Being a you know a line cook and all sorts of stuff, hard to name it. Um, so uh, um, he mentioned coffee. He was in California at the time, San Francisco. He, I know he mentioned that. Starbucks was the new thing. It was exploding here in on this coast in the Boston area and in Northampton. There was a, co a coffee company called Coffee Connection. The Does only anybody remember Coffee Connection? Had seven locations, and that was the whole. What's going to happen? Are they going to go against each other? Who's going to Become the, the coffee, whatever on this coast, and um, stuff was bottom up. So uh, that that's how they solved that issue. <laughs> and um, within months, all those locations flipped to Starbucks yeah. and, and Starbucks. So we were actually here in place, waiting for that wave to come and doing our thing. You mentioned selling coffee from Cal from San Francisco, um, and then 20 I don't know how many years ago we decided um, to we could do this ourselves after all of our educating ourselves and how to do it and be in the, in the, the field for the business for a couple years that so we decided to um, start researching roasters and uh, at the time it was a drum roast they were purchasing our coffee from it was good coffee um, but we always try to be ahead of the curve and do things differently hence we um, started a cafe we were one of the first um, drive-through gourmet cafes out here. We were the first um, in Massachusetts to serve coffee through a window. Yeah, one of the yeah, first. Yeah. So, what was that? It was the Java Hut down in Sunderland. Oh, oh. Yeah. 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 And yeah. before that, we, got, we had a kiosk cart on Campus of UMass for seven years or eight years, and we designed that. The idea obviously came from Seattle. Seattle, there kiosk carts everywhere. I think gas stations even had kiosk carts at the time. They were everywhere. <laughs> So we designed that with a friend of ours who was a carpenter um, and put that on campus at UMass. The thought process behind a cart was if it failed, we would move it somewhere else. <laughs> we, were, we were really trying to think outside the box of like not wasting our money and try to put it into things that would stick, you know, stay with us so often. Like, like I said, our dad had a restaurant and it put, it put him into a chapter 11 when we were in high school. So we, we we promised we would never own a restaurant, and then we had a cafe for like 12 years. So, you know, just the way it is. Um, so, so back to roasting. So we decided 
what can we do that's different than the statistical drum roast sort of research? And we, we read about um, air roasters and the pioneer air roast roasting coffee was a, a, a man named Sivitz, who before the air roast, which he basically didn't invent the process, but he basically created the whole um, roaster and all the patents and all the, <coughs> the science patents. and engineering behind it, which he brought his his. Um, background in the coffee industry from the from the 30s to almost the present. He passed away about five years ago. Yeah, in um, his late 90s. Yeah, in his mid to yeah, high 90s. Um, he, had his, he got his PhD from MIT, so he was using that engineering background with his coffee background. He's, he's always, his story was, I always knew there would be a, a way to make a better, smoother cup of coffee, so he developed the hot air convection roaster. We read about him. We're good friends at, um, you know, the Haymarket Cafe in Northampton. Peter, Peter and Dave. Dave. Yeah. They were our first account. Oddly <laughs> enough, That's we went to them, story. and when we were out on the road, we're like, all right, we're, gonna, we're not leaving, going home till we get accounts. So we went in yeah, there, we and did. Peter, who's such a nice guy, who still owns it, his brother left like eight years ago, he said he wanted to do it anymore. We're actually um, using his roaster right now in transition yeah. because we're, we remain such good friends, right and if we ever need to roast, he's got the same roaster that we originally bought. He's got a small, yeah, he's got a 25 pound roaster compared to our um, quarter bag and, and um, half bag roaster. So, but um, so we the four of us decided let's go out and visit Corvallis, Oregon. So we all went out for a weekend and we're floored by the process and the quality of what you can get um, compared to a drum roaster, um, the consistency, the um, the, uh, the the speed of it, the the ability to make a coffee that's not burnt, not bitter, won't upset your stomach. We actually have doctors in this area who people have stomach problems. Say drink Pierce Brothers coffee, it won't affect your stomach and stuff like that. So so we were all blown away. So we got back and we figured out. It took a while to get a bank to give us a loan. It was a small that goes time. back to the credit card thing I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is um, true. We we so started. So it took about a year or so before we were able to gather enough money um, to get the small roaster. Um, Many years. And we didn't, you know, at the time we didn't have a restaurant or anything. So basically, it was working full time and running the business. Anybody want a cup of coffee? Peter and Dave, have, they were already established. So they had a very successful cafe at the time, and they still do. So it was a little easier for them to leverage money and et cetera. But so. Um, and they joked about it at the time because when we they got theirs up and running, so we actually leaned on them to to assemble the thing. We finally got it like a year and a half later. Theirs is up in Shelburne Falls on the land that um, they own, um, a house where I think Peter still is. Um, and it's a tiny roaster, and they joked about, oh yeah, if we're gonna we're just gonna do this for the cafe. We want to sell to anybody else, and someday you guys will be, you know, you know, not stressing about money like and, and like we will be or whatever. It's kind of a joke, and um, because. So, so to step back a little bit, because of their experience with the cafe, that we went from um, buying coffee and distributing it and trying to sell it to getting our own roaster, getting a kiosk cart to help us with the cash flow, um, and then eventually open the cafe um, in Sunderland and put our roaster in there. So we were, the, we were actually one of the small, the first roaster cafes. It was kind of a combination of roaster cafe. And yeah, when I was in California, I thought it was cool that they would have coffee bags all through the cafe. And, and this one place I was at, they would actually build these temporary couches that people would sit on that were big coffee beans. And so it was my dream to, to emulate that. And um, I was gonna tell something else that was sort of funny. Oh. Me and Sean, not having sales backgrounds and not having business backgrounds, we both, Sean was a, uh, a psych, in, psych in English and I was a psych industrial psychology major. So a little bit of business, but not really a ton. And um, so we would read as many books about business. We would have these mantras that we would keep telling each other. Um, one of them was like, don't reinvent the wheel. You know, go find someone who's got experience. Um, we would, we would also be, the early bird gets the worm. We would literally get dressed, shower, we would go to church, and then we'd be home at seven in the morning with a phone, and we would be calling people. Um, we actually called our competitors because we thought our coffee was, we are like, hey, let's call Omar. We have great coffee, maybe they would like our coffee. And so we're sitting there, and the guy was like, and I won't use names, but he was like, you will never go anywhere. You need at least $100,000. You guys are failures already, and, and like, <laughs> And oddly enough, this guy 
ended up getting kicked out of his coffee business that he was in and started a second one. And we see him out there and we kick his butt whenever we can because we just remember the, <laughs> the the negative that he was in. He was so like, he made it so personal and we were like crying at seven <laughs> in the morning at a table. But that was our thing. It's like, you can't be successful unless you act successful. And then by acting successful, eventually you'll start having practices that'll get, lead you to success. So we always were up early. Whether or not we had anything to do, we would sit there at the table and just brainstorm. And um, when, our, I don't know if you guys know this, but we didn't know it at the time, the big coffee companies keep the small coffee companies out by providing all the equipment. So you'll get a guy who tries your coffee, he's like, this is great, I need two machines, all these servers, and, and a grinder. And we were just like, all right, bye. <laughs> and so we took all of our credit cards and we were sitting at the table and we got our first account, I think it was Cereos, no, Pete and Dave, but they didn't need equipment. Chris and Gary at Cereos really gave us a first op another first opportunity and we had to buy them a grinder. And we didn't know you could, you, could, you could get wholesale pricing if you were a roaster or, or claimed you were a wholesaler or something. So we went to Kitteridge and the, the grinder was like 1500 bucks and we were literally like, do we really want to do this? Because we had like $40,000, but that wouldn't get us anywhere. Um, and so we were literally like, all right, close your eyes. And at the time, the laws have changed. At the time, you could walk away from all your debt, and that includes credit card debt. So our game plan was we're young enough to go bankrupt, so we might as well leverage it all and see what happens. And, um, and since then, they changed the laws. You can, you can declare bankruptcy, but you can't walk away from your credit card debt, which is sort of insane. Don't really get that, but it is a law. Um, so that's where we were like, okay, we're leap of faith is what it was. And the funny thing is, is the grinder finally came in. It was sitting at Kitteridge's in Springfield. We were like, it's supposed to be here. And they kept like making excuses. We had to like drive down there and get it. It was horrible. Like it was like bad business 101. And, but, it, but another mantra that we always said, it's okay to make mistakes. Just don't keep making the same mistakes and learn from your mistakes. So we've made tons of mistakes, but we, I've, I've always had a paper thin um, line that we were walking. So. Um, we would remember those mistakes and try to build on them. All right, I'm done talking. You can talk. So, anyways, we we have a PowerPoint here. We've done this this PowerPoint for a few. We're asked to do this. We did it at Harvard last year, um, MIT, Western University. We do it for classes um, just to educate people about the coffee industry. I gave you um, a thing there about the regions, um, yes. about of, of coffee regions, also a flavor wheel there. Fair trade coffee, 100. percent That's all. We, that's all we purchase. That's all we, all we have ever purchased. We're one of the first, earliest companies to actually do that, 100. Um, percent We get calls from a lot of companies. Not so much anymore. Um, but how do you become organic, 100? percent it's, it's quite a process because we, when we became certified organic 20 and how many years ago, um, they said, "All right, great. You want to become organic? Come up with a plan and present to us." So we had to come up with a whole tracking because. Or because it's organic and fair trade, you have to be able to track it from the farm, the farmer itself, to everything in between, to the person, to the consumer who purchased it. And back again. And back again. So, and we have to keep records of that 12 years deep. We get, we get certified, <clears throat> we have to be recertified, or we're certified, we have to go through um, the uh, certification every year. It's a whole day process. And so, so if we take, say, we use a lot of um, <coughs> central, we use coffee with the world, you know, um, Sumatras, you know, different Indonesians, Central Americans, South Americans, um, but and we do a lot of blending. We do a lot of single origins, which you're drinking now. It's a Honduran. You can see on the um, the chart there. It gives an explanation of the, the what the Honduran tastes like, and you know, it's, I think it's spicy, sweet. Which one was memory right now? But um, so that's a single origin. We do a lot of blends. For example, our most popular coffee blend is Fogbuster. 
very intricate. That's by far the most popular blend. I think a lot of it has to do with the name that helps. Um, it's a dark, strong coffee, but it's very smooth because of how we roast it. Because of the quality of bean we use, we only buy the hardest bean, green bean, you can, you can find. Um, and on a scale from one to 10, we buy only eight to 10. So we're closer with our brokers, and we're closer with the small farmers. And so when we travel, we stay actually at the farms. Um, and um, so, uh, so that, that makes, so all those things combined, the, the freshness of the bean. Because the bean, if you, if you buy, we don't buy large quantities until we, until we taste it. And it, a lot of times, like, it tastes bitter, et cetera. There's a lot, a lot, a lot involved. We, we basically purchase all of our beans. Um, and uh, so the, the other thing about purchasing beans in the regions, they all grow at different times. The thing, great thing about coffee is it can be pretty much grow anywhere in the world. Um, the only place in America where you can buy coffee, or at least North America, is Hawaii. Where they grow the common is a lot of different it's a great yeah. bean. Coffee is um, an amazing plant. It is very it, durable. It's the only plant in the world. Now, probably going to find it somewhere on the internet that, that calls me a liar, but it's the only plant in the world that will have flowers and full mature fruit at the same time. It grows so high in the, uh, uh, up in the, in the atmosphere. Well, you grow at ground level, and, I mean at sea level, the and really good, a thousand feet in the air. The really good stuff is a thousand feet in the air. And the thought is, is in the morning when the mist comes in, the plants get the water and they start to grow and then they stop and then they start to grow again and they stop. And so one way they can protect themselves is by always being either in a flower state or a cherry state. And that is why they're picked by hand. Because if you shook the bush to just have all the beans fall out, you would have unripe ones and ripe ones. So that's why they're hand picked. Um, one coffee tree only produces one pound of coffee a year. And, and a coffee to bear fruit, I think, it's for, I think it's five years it takes to get to that point. Produce fruit, but they, you know, it's a very durable plant, so it lasts. Um, but we only purchase green bean that's grown 2,000 feet and above in the mountains. Um, again, you know, high in the mountains, it gets cold, it's frost, but this, they still survive. But in that, those green beans are called um, uh, arabicas. Anything grown below that, the, the, the high. Does anybody want a cup of coffee? Um, very bitter. Um, not a great tasting bean. Um, are called um, robusta beans. But basically, that's what they're talking about. That, that basically they shake the tree. So <clears throat> when it's harvested, you know, they sweep it up off the ground, and then it will have like sticks and stones and all sorts of stuff. And so they really have to process and get all this stuff out, etc. Yeah, but it's a very inexpensive bean. And it's high in caffeine, so a lot of companies will, to save money, will cut the two. But they don't really care about the quality or the taste. They just you know. A classic. It's a commodity. A classic. It's the second, second biggest commodity in the world is is green bean, first is oil. The classic so, espresso in Europe has a little bit of Robusta in it, and, and, high can, and usually Brazil. Does anybody want, know why Brazil would, would produce so much espresso in Italy? It's really fascinating. After World War II, a lot of Nazis went to Brazil, and they, they went then to, they sent- They went to Central and South America. Central and South abandoned America. Abandoned farms that were run by Germans. Yeah, and so they would ship all the stuff to their friends in Italy. Which is, I read that somewhere. And I was like, wow, that's so interesting. How history is always linked to the past well, and the future. And that's what's great about um, working with small farms. I mean, to, to get there's so many small farms. I mean, we we have you know friends who are from you know Central and South America, for example. And they're like, oh yeah, I grew up in my backyard. My grandmother would pick it. You know, Our friend Paco, who uh, owns uh, Amherst yeah. Pizza, Amherst Pizza House. Amherst. He's an old friend from many many years, but. They stopped, he was from El Salvador, and they actually, all the, 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 the forest took over a lot of their, their land uh, that was set aside for coffee because of the war that what happened in the 80s down there. And a lot of people fled and a lot of, he's like, they, there's so much coffee there that it, it doesn't even pay to pick it, which is And it's hard to get to market. So that's why working with small farmers, um, so, they, so to, to grow, you know, again, um, there's, there's a lot of, you know, think of it this way, to grow to um, grow coffee high in the mountains, to get um, equipment up there, to pick it, to move it, they have to, they have to, they have to, they have to hand pick it and put it in bags, it's hard work, to walk it down the mountain and to get it to market, so that's where um, fair trade products come into play, where they work, they seek out small farms and they make it, you know, purchase the small beans that have large, um, you know, uh, 
producers, etc. But so what happens with a lot of the small farms from for for um, I'll um, think for you for the uh, for a fair trade they, they they start a cooperative and so they'll sell all their you know not a lot a small farm you have a small little patio I think this supposed new patios when I was in New Mexico I bought them all it's a lot of like recent trip wool and where they dry it out they'll have um, a, just a um, a dry um, patio uh, well dry patio dry it out but to to um, take off the husk and all the kinds of leaves and dry the dry and wet process deep deep pulp and have right there on the patio. So they process and they'll bring it to the cooperative and sell it and then they'll get their you know fair market value. Um, yeah there's if people it's not fair trade um, then it's just take it or leave it. You know and if they're not getting the good value a lot of farms are abandoned for that reason. Yeah, in order to for them survive. to get their fair trade certification, which is a transfer USA certification, it's different in Europe, but um they have to pass, uh, they have to be interviewed, they have to pass all these strict standards to become a, co a fair trade cooperative. And what's nice is they, they share finances, they share equipment, like Sean said. But what's insane is like you would think a patio the size of a tennis court everywhere in America. I mean, America's paved everywhere you go. But if you have to carry those bags on a donkey to the top of a mountain to make a patio, it's really like a rich man's luxury um, a lot of people don't know this too when they when they're in one of the processes of making coffee is they actually wet it and let it ferment a little bit and so they have these big drawers where they pull it out and stuff I mean there's lots of processing expense to the processing of it and you wouldn't believe it but like one guy will have two acres of land and he'll only produce two, two 150 pound bags I mean that's nothing and then these guys what it is is the coyotes who are the people who take advantage of these workers would show up, they're the only guy with the truck in town, and you would have to sell to him because he's the only one who would get it to market and, and or had connections to get it out of the country. And, um, transfer and, and fair trade really did break down a lot of those walls and cut out a lot of middlemen. We pay a premium, so when the market bottoms out and everybody's like, coffee just went down, why, why haven't you lowered your prices? We have to pay a certain amount per pound so that the farmers um, get what what get their contracts and get the money that that's without the middleman involved. Um, a few years back, when the market um, skyrocketed, I'd say like seven or eight years ago, it skyrocketed through the roof, and a lot of our fair trade contracts were being um, not honored because these people were were getting money waved in their face, and and so they were like, oh, I'm, I can sell it for twice as much now. Why would I, you know? sell it for the price that you're offering. So it was a difficult time for us. We couldn't even get contracts because there was, n nobody was um, selling it um, as much, as Does easily. Does everybody have a cup of coffee or want a cup of coffee? I don't know. I wasn't making it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is single origin. It's a Honduran, it's a, the flavor wheel there if you want. We tend to jump um, around a lot if anybody has any questions. Try to follow this, I mean, we talked about, you know, this right here is, is Mexico also, you can see High in the mountains. This was this photo here I took was walking up with the farmers. Um, actually, yeah, the farm people lived in the mountains high up. Um, we got there. There was a big celebration. It was great. Um, and they slaughtered chickens. Um, it's like whole chickens. It was great. Um, very welcoming. Very kind people. All just family oriented. They had just gone through a map at the time. It was seven years ago, six years ago. Um, they just had a. Um, a massive storm go through there and wiped out all the roads, wiped out, um, you know, part of the village kind of sad as people died, um, so right on the river. So but you can see that just, they, they worked really hard. They had to carve um, out of the mountain the stairs to get to where we're going because the village would be here and up in the mountains where they grow. And that's where they have their, their, their grave sites. So when I was going up there, it was, um, they just had, they just celebrated um, All Souls Day or something like that. And the graveyard was beautifully decorated with all these colors. And, it was right there where they grow their bananas. A lot of these farms grow bananas. Um, they raise um, honeybees, um, cocoa, and, um, and um, coffee all together so they can sell it. Because it all works together as part of the environment. So the other thing that we buy, all of our green bean that we source is grown um, in the jungle. So they're not destroying the jungle to grow. They grow it in the jungle. So it's a natural canopy. So they don't have to use nets to keep the birds meet the fruit and all that kind of stuff. Um, which was kind of, was really cool, but that's how we source it's bird friendly. Um, organic, 100% means no pesticides at all. That's all we source. 
Um, the other thing is that because the farms at this level are so high, and pesticides are expensive, so most of the, most of the farms up there aren't they're organic anyways. They're not using pesticides because they can't get it up there. They're not going to waste the time and the money to spray and get it up there, um, and then to get it back down. So most coffee, these small farms high in the mountains are already organic, but they have to become certified to prove it to the customer. So that's why you look for that USDA seal saying that it is certified. So that's we have to go through the process to prove them from the farm and the brokers and whoever brings them to the country. That's where there's a paper trail. So you know if it has an organic seal on it on the front, USDA, it, it, then you are buying a product that is organic. Doesn't that's Because when a farm, if you use pesticides, it takes eight years to get out of the soil. So they have to wait eight years before they become certified organic. So it's quite a process. And yeah, when people I talk to the farmers can't have bought their land. They, they need a buffer zone. So and when I when I when I ask the farmers when I travel, you know, I don't so much anymore. But when the first this years ago, does being organic and fair trade make a difference? And they're like, yeah. Now that I'm fair trade, I can support my family. I can put food on the table. Uh, I can have confident farm. I feel comfortable leaving the farm to my children. And and also the um, farms that were using pesticides are like, yeah, I see. To all the animals and all the fruits more um, vibrant, etc. You know, so um, they had a cool, well, I guess the cool story when I was walking on this specific trip, um, uh, I don't really travel anymore as much. We um, have sent people, some employees, um, one of our employees went to Columbia for two years. We're, we're going to go to Smart this year because of our move. Does anybody want a cup of coffee? But um, <laughs> from now, we're going to just send employees to go and meet the farmers and get you know educated, take photos, and all kind of stuff. But um. When I was on this trail, I was walking on the path, and um, uh, a um, coral snake went across my foot, and then that's when I realized, holy crap, I'm in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Up here, so you are like you are in the jungle. And um, the next photo, and this is just like sort of, you can see how this is about six thousand feet. So. farmers and you know they they were like come on in here and pick with me I'm like no that's okay I'll stay on the trail because <laughs> banana spiders are very poisonous you know I mean so I, at that moment I realized cause I've traveled all over many times never thought about it before and I've bit, been bitten by spiders sleeping under some mosquito nets and stuff like that Costa Rica or other countries but at that moment it made me realize maybe because I was getting older <laughs> um, switch there's some green bean you can see. That's actually Guatemala. Um, do you want to talk about, I pass it, um, uh, how they discovered the monks? Oh, yeah. In they, Ethiopia, discovered they, coffee. You guys probably heard the story a million times. Kaladi, I think, is, was, was the... The goat. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting thing is you couldn't... They, they made it illegal to leave... Um, leave countries with green beans so they didn't want to spread Ethiopia is the only place in the world where where it was growing naturally like on the tree um, out in the out in the woods and whatnot and um, oddly enough it was a priest that stole it and <laughs> smuggled it out of the country in his belt is what they said um, and he had it spread all over the world really quickly um, what's funny about that is they they when coffee started to take off and they had all these Penny, they call them penny colleges, basically a coffee house. Um, that's where like the the Boston Tea Party was was planned out in a penny college and, and um, just thinkers, place where people get together and have coffee and, and think. Um, and and so there was a period where they really wanted to outlaw coffee in the Catholic Church, and they appealed to the to the Pope to outlaw in the world. And the Pope said, you know what? You can stay up a lot later and pray a lot more. <laughs> so that's, that's why he didn't. He said, if the monks can pray throughout the night, drink coffee, so be it. <laughs> so they, they, it never became illegal. Um, so that's just a touch on that story. And, I mean, I talked about um, being organic. One thing that's great about these farms, these organic farms, is that they all have above ground um, worm farms and all the pulp and everything that they take off um, the bean. Because every, every cherry, a, 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 a ripe, healthy cherry has two beans in it, two green beans. Um, so 
they take all that, they grow it, they have their, they introduce it back into the soil, talk about here, you know, introducing your fertilizer because the tree does, you know, deplete the soil, and they introduce, introduce that back to the trees into their own soil. So there's a constant rotation out there, they keep going. It's neat seeing these long boxes that are like length like that just go around, um, they're above ground in warm farms, and they introduce that back to the soil as well. It's pretty cool um, they do that. Uh, yes. With, with so many small farms, how do you determine what to do business with? We work with brokers who have really strong relationships. We work with Atlas, which is a company out of Washington State. Our main company that we've been working with and grew with for the last 20 years. Uh, New York City, they're one of the founders of, of bringing coffee into the country. They started in the 70s. A guy named Bob and his wife started out in, out in California. I actually traveled with them once when I was in. Central America, and they started another company. They, they came to New York, and there's a guy, two other guys, a guy named Richard and Jamie, um, took it over, and they basically have taken over that part of it. Um, but they have a fantastic relationship with the farmers, and they introduce, introduce us to the farmers, and the farmers know us, they talk about us, and we go and we get to meet them. So it's built that personal relationship with them. Once or twice a year, they'll call um, us and they'll say, Hey, we're going here, and you want to come? And, and we just started working with another. Um, What's his name? Oh, a really small company. and Just work. started, two guys. Joey. But he's a small company, and he's been traveling in country, and he's just literally right out of school, got out of uh, college, and um, he's got a lot of heart. And when he said, I want to sell you coffee, we tried it. He's got great coffee. He's got great connections. He's always in country. And um, he did get to stay there for a long time. But, but he wasn't Harvest. fair trade or organic. So we pushed him and he got the right certification. So we're doing really good business with him. Um, we, want, we want to do it ourselves eventually, but again, the, the time, the money, you have to have a broker's license. You have to have a, um, um, I can't think right now, a license to bring it over the border. Import. An importing license. The, um, the insurance you need, so if something's wrong, then you have to be there during harvesting. You have to so you be have there the whole time. Well, a lot of what happens, they've got there. these um, water yeah, analysis the machines. So when you get a sample, you, 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 you leave with a sample, and when the container's coming across the country, you have that sample, and when it, sh when it hits America, you put both into this machine, and it spits out the yeah, If they do that before they leave, they're on the dock. Well, I'm saying both. At the farm, but that's where the relationship comes with the farm, because you become like family, and so they, every year they look back because we're, you know, we and they are supporting them, we're paying the premium price for the green bean, and then we're selling, you know, we're making it work here, so it, it goes, you know, full circle. One of the biggest problems with importing is if you if you give the money to a third person and they hold it until the contract is filled, but if you're sitting here and you need the coffee and you get it and it's not what you ordered and then some, you, how do you send it back? Where do you get your money? It really puts you in a pickle. And, and um, we dabbled. We tried to start a cooperative with Pete and Dave and, and, and Indigo and a couple other people in the area. And um, we're, we're stick to it kind of guys, but it was just like, it's not even worth it. Setting it up would be more expensive because we're not using enough of it to pay for the business it would cost to import it ourselves. And that's where we, we, we just have great relationships with, with a few people and have over the last you know couple decades. Yeah. And it's just neat because they were really small and now they're getting bigger and we're getting bigger. And a lot of what's hard for us is they become our bank and they don't want to be our bank. Because the, the, like we, we'll put aside a container of coffee that we like, and they warehouse it, and we pay a little bit per pound until it's used up, and and um, and so you pay a certain price per pound, whatever the market is. But if we go over that contract, then they start charging us interest. And so well, not only like that, we have to really have a figure on the pulse of what we're going to use, and um, also again going back to green bean. After a year, it starts to get sour. So if you don't use it. And it can't freeze. You can't so freeze. It's got to stay at room temperature. It's a lot of, a lot of variables. And that's what's great about our new building is we'll finally be able to. Right now we get a pallet, and then the next day we'll get another pallet, and then two days later we'll get another pallet. So we'll use four pallets of coffee a week, but it comes at four hundred dollars for shipping, four hundred dollars for shipping, and we want it, and we just had no place to put it in our old warehouse, and in our new warehouse we'll be able to have a, a, a hopefully a container of coffee on the floor and not run out. I mean. 
so funny, the, the hurricane that hit New York a couple years back, yeah, it hit, it, it knocked everything out, and we needed coffee, and we were out, and they were just like, nope, nope, you can't even get gas down here, don't come down here, and we literally sent two of our guys on a kamikaze we went mission, to the truck. We went to yeah, the warehouse and picked up coffee, and we were like, make sure you get gas in Connecticut before you enter, <laughs> and enter New York, and they were like, that was the best advice you gave us. As soon as they like got into New York, there were like abandoned cars, and there were people like, I need water, and they were, and and you know, it's a. Yeah. Well, it's really just a seven-hour round trip, especially when there's no traffic on the roads, and um, and and we couldn't go, but but our friends Steve and Christian went, and our master, uh, went. Our master Rosie went, and it was quite the experience. They were like, it it talk about third world countries. Within like a week, New York City was a third world country. And uh, it's just amazing how the infrastructure just collapses in on itself, even in this day and age. This is actually a guy who asked me to pick with him and like, that's okay, I'll just take a picture. <laughs> I know we're getting to the bottom. Does anybody want a cup of coffee? <laughs> I'll keep drinking it. <laughs> how much time do we have? have? Do we have to be kicked? Kick, 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 kick. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> Is that over here, sir? There you go. So this is an example of a wet depulper. So all the beans run through and it takes the pulp and everything off and separates them into the channel. The workers will spread them out and then eventually they'll put them out on um, uh, patios so you have to dry in the sun. So, so they get pets, they get pets, they look like that. Yep, they look like that. The first thing you do is the pulping. Yep, that's the pulping right there. And then you get the two beans. The two beans, yep. They're separated, they're they're washed. Crazy. They're crazy. There's, 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 there's washed or unwashed beans. Every single ounce of the wash process. Every single ounce of the wash process. And then um, it goes out in the patio. It's like dry in a period of time. And then they sweep them up. And then it's cut. Um, an organic bean, um, every organic bean is touched, it just it makes the most amazing by coffee. When you dye them in different hands, to the whole again, yeah, so you can see what the process is. We, we like to compare the way we do our coffee, the way we source, the way we blend it, like a fine wine, because we're, we're buying like, fine wine, buying the best grapes they can find, they're blending the grapes from different regions to give it a certain taste. That's what we do, again, going back to our fog wash. Our fog wash is five different beans, all roasted at, all come from different regions, they, every region has a different taste. So we're looking for our own profile for the fog bus. So not only is our fog bus are dark, strong, smoky, backbone, but kind of sweet, and finishes smooth. And we use, um, and roast it all, all, all different temperatures. Um, and so, for example, we use um, uh, a, a Timor, which we roast dark. Uh, Guatemala, which is a nice sweet bean. In Guatemala, they have, I think, 33 active volcanoes in Guatemala alone. Um, soil it's a great soil. I love Guatemala. It's a nice, sweet. That's how we got into fair trade coffee. Um, was because in our fog buster we had this amazing Guatemala, and when we went to reorder it, they, they Richard was like, "Can't get it. They're out of business." I'm like, "What? Well, they're out of business?" And he's like, "Yep." It, it, at that time, it was too expensive to pay people to pick the coffee, and they went out of business. It and we were like, wild. And that's when he was like, back. you should look into fair trade companies. And at the time, we, were, we hadn't heard about them. We are like, what are you talking about? Fair back trade was like me. Back in 94, and I, I don't remember. I don't remember. But, um, so, uh, oh yeah, so, so, so basically we're trying to use a lot of the flavor of the wheel um, to get the taste we're looking for. Um, and then, so we basically roast, and then our sumatra we roast light. It's a nice, earth, nice earthy bean. Uh, we like that kind of spicy. And so it sort of rounds the whole, the whole palate. Um, but because we do a lot of blending, in fact, it's organic and fair trade, everything is contracted. So when you roast it, it has an R number, and it, you know, it shows the region, um, an R for roast. And we take, and we roast everything we roast individually. We don't roast it all together. A lot, a lot of the larger companies roast to save time and money. They'll blend it all together, and they do a blend and roast it all at once. And the thing that's bad that about that is, is, is not effective because every bean, one has different sugar content, different yields, different taste, and mixes it together, it makes it finish. And then, but it's the difference, every bean's different size. So if the beans are consistent, they're gonna get a different um, attention of, of heat and, and, and tran um, the transfer of that. But that's what, that's what another thing segues into our roaster. Because we're a hydro convection roaster, our beans float on air. So every bean's getting the exact same attention. 
So we it's take those variables out, and it's a fluid variable, so we take those variables out. So we're roasting only one type of bean, and we get them together, and then we blend them. So it takes longer, it's more expensive to do it that way because we're organic, everybody has to wear gloves, everybody has to wear a mask, a hair net. We're you know, high in food um, certified. Um, so there's a lot of those variables. So when people say, oh, you're expensive, well, where do you want me to begin why we're more expensive? We're still less expensive than a lot of the companies considering. Um, yeah, um, because Bob Marley's of, son uh, has a company where it's $25 a pound, and NYU buys it for their regular handout coffee. And we're like, whoa, okay, <laughs> stay with them. <laughs> um, but what's, it, what's one thing that, that we love to do, like Sean said, is, is blend. Our house blend is um, three different coffees. It's a, a, a Peru, a Sumatra, and a Honduran. But we don't just roast three coffees and put them together. We roast each one at two different temperatures so the flavor spectrum is longer and larger and so when we blend all those together it's like it starts off subtle but it just keeps the, all the flavors just keep going on and that's that's where our culinary background comes in because we worked at so many restaurants i worked at coletto's in in san francisco i we worked at you know in here around here we worked at um rafters the pub uh, so many restaurants i can go on and on but I was the first dishwasher to work at um, Seasons Restaurant and the pub, which was so funny <laughs> because it was an honor that I had at the time. I was 15. They wouldn't even let me use a knife. Like they'd be like, cut all these tomatoes, and they'd give me like uh, not even a butcher knife, like like not even a steak knife. But um, just funny how time flies. <laughs> That's a picture of me. I'm not sure where that is. Okay, but they're wrong. Um, an example of a small patio and someone's one of the farmers you see their laundry's back there and spread it out and that's what they're going to have and that's those are some cocoa beans cocoa beans cocoa yeah cocoa but cocoa beans right there dry them out on one of the small patios and then they'll bring that to market and sell it mm. and that's way up in the mountains so often we have get get into this, the closest do city or whatever is, you know do any animals or anything Get into this? You know, they're birds, 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 monkeys, believe in, 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 in ch the cherry form. But you mean like actually, on the ground, what it yeah. like to contaminate no. it? Yeah. No, not too much. I mean, There's that's no a great question. I do agree. Once you process it, yeah. There, yeah. there is some funky stuff that'll end up in the coffee. We, when we're roasting, <laughs> at, at the heavy stuff goes to the bottom of our roaster, and when we're scraping it out, we'll pull out rocks, coins, jewelry. Yeah. Yep. And, and it happens all the time. Yeah, I actually. Found a, um, a, a candy bar wrapper, which is weird from Sumatra. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually just had a customer call me, and I can't remember who it was, but he was like, "There's, there was some metal in my coffee," and he was like all pissed. And I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! That's why it gets ground. So it never, you know, you'll catch it in your grinder. Most good grinders have magnets to catch the metal. But I, he was like, "Is this normal?" I'm like, "More normal than you know." <laughs> happens all the time we're constantly like if our big grinder has a magnet on it and once a week we'll pull it off and there'll be like all these weird metals sticking out of it and it's because they just put it on patios and sweep it up i mean this yeah, they go through it by hand too but stuff gets through because they're touching thousands millions yeah millions. uh i can't, I can't try to remember every single coffee bean goes through eight pairs of hands before it makes it into your cup and that's the picker the sorter the resorter the bagger every, every, every bean is touched hundreds of times yeah it's just amazing and, and honestly what's so funny there's this coffee company right now that that claims their coffee is the best because they send it through a laser um a sorter after they buy it and then it, it like poofs out the ones that are deformed or not the right size or discolored and um and it was really? so funny well, that means the crappy bean to start with yeah and that's what i said i said yeah they're saving money by buying crappy coffee and then resorting it at the end with a machine and i said who, who do you sell the bad stuff to because you know Anyways, it's just funny. This is the banter we have when we're driving together. Back, you can see how they're sorting it right there. Yeah. And that's where they grade it by size, quality. Um, and that's where, you know, it's, just, it's really hand. If, if, if it was wine, it's co coffee should be more expensive than champagne for the, for the amount of effort that goes into it. 
it's amazing that it's not. Yeah. And again, there's so many different levels of coffee. No, but. Any questions? Who came up with the recipe for fly cluster? You know, that was the kitchen sink at the time. We were just <laughs> trying different things, and, and um, we used to, um, not used to, taste. but at the time, we were like, we would take a Timor and we roast it like four different ways. And when you roast Timor really dark, we called it like the dirty ashtray. It was like so in your face, strong and caramely. It would be terrible on its own, but it's great in a blend. And that's where we try to, every now and then we have to switch because of what bean we can actually get. Like Guatemala, we'll, if we can get a really great Guatemala, we'll use it. If we can't, we'll try to replace it with something comparable. But it is always five different beans because we're great believers in, in with blends to fill the whole palate that um, quality and know. taste. And, and a, a lot of companies will roast, just roast something really dark, just to, because they're roasting a dark roast. But if it's not roasted at the, the, the right temperature, um, one, if, a, if, a, if a, um, in, in our roast, especially because it's an air roast, if you roast over 480 degrees for too long, It'll basically just disintegrate and go up into the system because well, another thing about a roaster what we do this is a picture of one of our, our small roaster our first roaster um, all, all green bean after it's processed has husk on it peanut husk chaff um, in our roasting process the chaff is completely right here. separated yeah you want to pass that around or yeah if, if anybody comes, wants to take a closer green, look the they call it green bean it comes in a green bean form but it can be um, gray or tan or like a, some beautiful colors from wherever. Um, but, uh, as it's roasted, a green bean almost doubles in size because a majority of the, the bean is water. And it loses so a third of its weight. It loses a third of its weight it's in our process. So when that happens, the bean, the, the chaff pops off and because of Civet's brilliant engineering, um, that, because of light of the, the bean, it'll float up into the chamber and get separated into a separate um, compartment. So. In the end, when it's done roasting, we put it in the cooling it gets tray. Separated. It, it, gets, it goes into the cyclone, so yep. it floats like paper up it's in the air and then it gets separated out of the cyclone. The bucket. And that's what gives the burnt bitterness. Not only the, the poorness of the poor, um, um, poor uh, quality of the coffee bean, but also the chaff. So it happens in it, the first crack. When you're roasting yeah. coffee, there's two cracks. You'll actually, if you ever cook green beans in, on your skillet or, or in your oven, you can audibly hear the crack, and that's the water escaping from the center of the bean, and it makes like a snap, crackle, pop sound. And then the second time you start hearing it crack, that's when it's going into, from a light roast into a medium roast. So, so you can roast by ear if you really know what you're doing. And, what, and so what our roaster does, from the diff to the drum roaster, it separates that. So that's why we, we trademark the clean bean. One of the reasons because it's not it's not burnt, it's not bitter. There's still it's still a body. And, and when you roast our coffee, because we do all individually, um, it doesn't smell burnt. If you ever notice um, other coffees, it will smell kind of burnt or bitter. Mm -hmm. Ours smells sweet because the also, natural oils and natural sugars come to the surface as, as the coffee to mature. It takes three days for it to mature fully. And if, but, you, um, if you take a drum roaster's coffee and you plunge your hand into it and pull it out, it'll be speckled with all the, the burnt chaff. Particles. If you put it in ours, there's absolutely nothing on it. But you will, if you put it into chaff. somebody else's, you'll see another, all the... In a, in another example is, you ever break a cup of coffee and leave a ring around it? Yeah. Ours doesn't leave a ring. It's yeah. smooth because that is the chaff. You're, the soot, you're actually drinking soot. Oh. We grind it up. That gets through the filter in the brewing process because it heats up. That gets through, that's what upsets your stomach. Um, gives you heartburn, all that kind of stuff. Um, what do you uh, do with your chow? Give it to farmers. farmers. Oh, okay. Yeah, they yeah. can't, can't grape enough. Yeah. Yeah. And it, from mulch yeah. and everything, it's great. There well, was a period composting. where me and Sean were like, it's the perfect mulch. Like, we, I use it in my garden. It, 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 it creates a, a, a tough, a a hard carapace when you water it. It'll float down and become hard, which keeps the um, weeds. weeds from coming up. It keeps the soil more moist. It keeps the heat in the ground. And plants love that, so they'll grow faster. Um, me and Sean have a good friend I went to school with, Dan Zomack, and he runs the Hadley Garden Center. And we... we like, sure, bring it in. Yeah, because <laughs> he was like, we sell almond chaff for like 50 bucks a, a big bag. And we were like, whoa, that sounds like dollar signs. 
So <laughs> we, we sent the stuff to this lab called Silkier in Chicago and they ran the tests on the pot, uh, pot and ash and all these things that you need to have on your bag so that, so that if someone who really knows gardens and, and soil, soil scientists, can prescribe what you need for your soil. Um, long story short, we saved up like three or four pallets of chaff we put in our old coffee bags and I gave it to him. He's like, I'm gonna play around with it, give it to some people. And he said, yeah, this could really work. When can you get me more? And we're like, that took us about a year. <laughs> <laughs> that was when this roast was small. We have a second roast right now that's much bigger. But, but um, and the other thing about this, about the coffee with so soil, because you guys know now with all the studies coming out, they say coffee's bad for you. Organic, you know, iron coffee without chemicals is actually really good. There's more more vitamins in coffee and antioxidants than any other um, more than blue vegetable or fruit that you that you can consume. Does anybody else want to more? There's more antioxidants in blueberry, much more than, than blueberry and, and, and green tea. Um, it's so good for you. So that goes back on the soil. Years there was not wasn't that long ago where there are companies were coming out with um, uh, coffee juice. I don't know if you remember that coffee. It didn't take off. But it's, it was so good. And they, they, part of their marketing was showing you the green tea, blueberries, you know, they went the whole um, antioxidant route and it was like spiked way above it. It's so good for you, but. More, it's better for you than green tea. Yeah. And, and then you can look that up. And it's, we, it's, I can't believe it. When I was over there, say. whenever I go travel, I'll eat it off the tree because it's cherry. It tastes great. Mm -hmm. um, they separate the beans or whatever. <clears throat> but um, so, so we were like, we should come up with it. We should find farms that. Just want to sell us the, the, the cherries and let's make juice. So we did this massive research. We talked to one of our brokers when we were with Molson. He's like, Yeah, that's an interesting day. He did so much research. This was like 15 years, 14, uh, 12 years ago, whatever. And couldn't find any farms that were willing to do that. And we, you know, we're small. We didn't have capital to really go after it. And we talked, we talked to some big companies about it. That's a great idea, blah, blah, blah. Never went anywhere. And then, like, three years later, it, it was everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can find but it, it didn't there. take, didn't catch on. You know, everybody thought it was going to catch on to the pomegranate juice. It came out around the same, or just after that, took off. Just interesting, but I'm surprised it catch on. It tastes good, and it's so good for you. Better than anything you can consume. But and we keep talking about blends and stuff. This is a single origin, and and you know, to to, to I'm enjoying single origins again. It's like rediscovering coffee because it's like you know, it's it's easy to go out and blend things. I don't know if you guys know this, but in the wine industry, there's varietals, proprietals. A company like like um, Christian Brothers will be like, wow, our Chardonnay really didn't do that well, so they'll buy um, grapes from other people. If it's a, uh, and so they have single origin wines and whatnot, and it's always easier if the grapes don't taste good to mix in other grapes to make it taste good or to get what they're looking for. Um, that's pretty common. My first job out of college before when I first got to California. I took, I was trying to get a job so bad I couldn't find one anywhere, so I took a job with Young's Market selling Almaden and Inglenook and Bolio Vineyards and Christian Brothers in Gallo country. They, I told them I was a team player and they sent me to Fresno and I literally, my boss would be like, it's a luckies day, go out and hit all your luckies today. And my first lucky was in Bakersfield and my last lucky store was in Modesto. And if you know California, that's like a 150 mile drive. And if I didn't hit 50 stores that day and fill up my paperwork right, it, I didn't last long at the job. I moved back to, to San Francisco and I was like, uh. but anyways, I learned a ton about wine. And it, and it literally transfers straight over to the coffee industry, all the stuff I learned there. Um, I have trouble with this, so I'm get what I can. But um, this was in uh, one of my trips. I think it's in Columbia. I don't remember. But um, this guy here, he works for um, one of the, the one of the brokers, which is one of the first companies. Interesting story about Royal Coffee out of um, California, LA area. Bob and his wife, the founders of it, again go back to like the early '70s. They were like basically bringing importing green bean, um, and then selling out the trunk of their Buick. And that's how they started. It's kind of neat and cool story. Um, and this guy right here, um, really nice guy. I traveled with him. Um, he was uh, he works for them, and he was also the translator because. 
I, I was able to, I used to be able to get by with, you know, speaking Spanish um, or understand it, but um, again, if you don't use it, lose it. Our sister lived in Costa Rica for a year and she has trouble getting by with it now. She's a dream in Spanish, but anyways. So, but it was, it, um, so it'd be great. So it would, it would make things easier to, to travel with him. We go out to dinner with a lot of farmers and it was neat because they couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak Spanish, but just a lot of smiling going back and forth. <laughs> and listening to our translators. <laughs> But um, he brought me to meet this guy here, and this guy is one of the pristine um, coffee um, cuppers in the world. So he was like, oh, we're going to go see this guy. He's like famous, and it was neat. You know, that's a, that's a typical lab um, in one of, the, one of the, um, the, the, the larger farms. And so we were, you know, passing around. Basically, you, you take coffee, you put it in the, in the cup, and you pour extremely hot water and let it um, float to the top and creates a crust. That's how you... Then you break it with a spoon, and then you you want to spray it across your tongue. Um, I burned the crap out of my mouth that day, so <laughs> my taste was, was way off, and I was embarrassed because this guy is like the expert. <laughs> um, but it's you know, so it's, it, it's fun, you know, you know, traveling and meeting people. And, um, you are working, but it's like, oh, it's great, you're gonna go. And I'm like, no, I don't see anything. We get up at crack of dawn, and we're on the road, and a lot of it's rough traveling, you know, and you know, so and we get back and have a beer and fall, we'll all fall asleep. You know, wherever we are, mm -hmm. staying on, you know, at the farm or wherever, if we're staying some someplace. But um, so. does anybody have any questions? I know we're talking a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, does the roaster? Does your roaster go 24 hours a day? <laughs> no. We're talking about roasting mm -hmm. all these yeah. beans separately. I'm just no. trying to. No, we're still pretty small. We, Five days we, a week. Yeah, we, we've got one guy who comes in at 7, and then we're usually done by 3 o'clock. Oh, okay. Um, when we had our small roaster... That's not true. We're done by 5. Second. Yeah. We're trying to roast more. But when we had our small roaster, it was... It was it would only do... It would, we'd put 35 pounds in and get about 29 pounds out, and so um, we'd have to roast a lot more of that. Our, our new roaster is three times bigger than that. And yeah. It's so funny because our guy Christian, like I said, is roasting up at Peter and Dave's... Um, it's uh, tiny roaster. It's, it's so small. It's they actually so modified it so it's a 20-pound roaster. And he did like 20 roasts today, and he came back with like 100 pounds of coffee, which would have been like, you know, one roast from our oh, bigger okay. roaster. Yeah. But it's just interesting. This is um, an example of our air roasting. You can see how the beans, the hot air goes in um, and, and travels up through the beans. Um, and then you can see how the chaff, just a, a, as an example. Again, the difference between this and a drum roaster, a drum roaster, I mean, it's pretty simple. The beans, here's a drum, it's all in there, it just turns like this and tumbles, the beans mm -hmm. tumble. So anything out on this side is not getting the same attention as the coffee in the middle, and you're hoping that that gets the same attention. So it's very inconsistent. So stuff always gets scalded on the metal. Um, so, so in the finished process, it's very consistent. Plus, it gets so hot, it's like coals. And we, on our roaster, it's just hot air. We can throw paper in there, and the paper won't disintegrate. It'll come out a little brown. If that was a drum roaster, it'd be gone. The other thing, too, is in a drum roaster, that's where the, soot um, from. the soot builds up on the inside and becomes a, a insulator. So to control the temperature, you got to turn it up and keep turning it up because the, 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 the actual soot on the inside becomes like a thick insulator. Um, and it's hard to control the temperature. And <clears throat> the only way you can see the bean is by, put, put, it's called the glory hole, where you take it out on that little spoon and you look at it. Um, our roaster, actually as it's tumbling it scours the inside so it actually it's like polished metal on the inside up here it gets a little you know oily and stuff but the inside of our roaster is always pristine and we actually have glass ports that you can look into because nothing catches on fire there's no soot in, in our process it doesn't Whereas, almost that thing be covered in the week yeah pete's coffee you just, they're they're Back in the day, their big claim to fame was they would break down the roaster and clean it every seven days. Um, we don't have to do that. We do ours quarterly. Um, I don't know if anybody reads the paper. We did have a, a fire in our cooling tray a few years back, which um, we didn't even think about it, but the, the cooling tray sucks the air from the room through the beans to cool it down really quick so it stops the roasting process. And we weren't thinking because it just seems like dry air, but it was actually building up a creosote in the in the tube. And um, we had a really hot roast that we had to pull once because they killed our electricity on our street and didn't tell us. And um, it heated up so much in there, we turned the blower on. It actually was stoking 
the flames. And so it, 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 there's a picture of a fireman walking out of our building and it says, the smoking gun. <laughs> and it was, like, <laughs> was smoking and um, it's just scary. When you have your own business, you'll do anything too. Like uh, there was a time when, when um, it was a, there was a bad, uh, fire's not the word because it wasn't flames and it wasn't out of control, but there was a lot of smoke in the room and Sean like cr belly crawled in there to like, like we got all of our employees out, everybody run, don't go in there. And then of course me and Sean are like crawling in there looking for it and looking for the source of the fire. The great thing about this is it's, you know, it's designed to hold up to 600 degrees in it. So in theory, it's like having a fire in your, in your stove. If, it, if, you, if you can kill the oxygen going to it, it really won't burst into flames. We always have a hose on hand to douse it if we need to. And uh, our protocol now is if the electricity gets cut out, um, we pull it immediately. And then if we have to, if it's overheating, we push it into a big metal vat and then douse it with water. That's our emergency plan that, that we tell HACCP that we do. And, and we do, we have the big troughs there and stuff. We haven't had to use it, but um, you know, in, a, in, a, in an emergency. And that's the other thing too, we, we don't, um, unless you're a really experienced roaster and, and, and our younger guys who are roasting, we don't let them roast on their own. Only Christian, our master roaster, do we let roast with no one else there for safety reasons. Even um, for not even here, yeah. Funny thing about him is, um, he's gonna tell this is funny. He, our parents, and he went to Jamaica. Um, they volunteered for two weeks to be able to help the um, poor and they, um, et cetera. And um, that's what they met. And they're like, This is great, great young guy. I think at the time he was like 20, 21. He whatever. wasn't even 21. He was 20, and he, he and his dad were there. And boy, and he's looking for a job. You should talk to him. So we talked to him. We, we hit it off. And after the interview, like, Okay, we're gonna hire you. And we're like, um, so we hired to be a driver. He's like, I don't even have a license. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time when it was like me, Darren, Darren's father. I was with us forever. He retired, and then he's working for us doing sales and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then at the time, Mindy, I think it was like, and then maybe Matt, who yep. was our master roaster at the time, um, who was a student at UMass, getting his PhD in philosophy, and was always just sitting at the bar when we had our, our cafe and. That turned into a job. See, he, he was one of the guys who was like, he was an artist, fantastic talent. He was the one who was like so disappointed when we couldn't get that Guatemalan, which totally changed the, the taste of our fogos at that time. And, and to this day, he knows he's no longer alive, but for the longest time, he's like, you never know to get that fogos or taste back. You know? and, he's, and I think he still had one pound left in his freezer. <laughs> and he turned his dad onto it, who's a professor out in California who always calls us for coffee now, Fog Wester. Um, Ron. He's interesting. Ron, yeah. Ron nice. But, um, where's it go? So basically, we sold them, so we were like, all right, so Christian started working for us doing different stuff, and now he's our master roaster. Because Matt moved on, but it's interesting. It was like nine, ten years ago. So this is a fair trade symbol that we use. Um, it's a fair trade USA. It's the um, only independent third party auditor out there. If you don't see fair the trade. fair trade certification on there, then you really, there's fairly traded coffee. There's people who um, like to, they, they throw around the word fair. You, you, you can get away with it because these Those guys don't go and sue kind of you. Stuff, but you if, you, know. if you throw around the word organic, the feds come after you. And that actually happened to us when we were a long, 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 long time ago. First year. Bud from Cornucopia called and he's like, hey, one of your competitions said you're not organic. And I'm like, I'm looking at the bag right now, it says organic. And like, we didn't know, we thought you used organic beans and it well, was it was, it was organic. certified organic from the farm, but then we weren't certified organic. So that's another process because we have to track it here. So, so, so the feds called us organic. and they said, we were young, they were like, if you don't stop immediately, we're charging you with ten thousand dollars, and we're both like ten thousand dollars. We're out of business, and like we just said, we didn't mean to. We're gonna get certified they were, right away, and they're then, like, okay, that's all we want to hear. But because it's such a new process, we worked with. Um, we still work with Bay State certifiers. Don was the name Don at the time. Great guy came in, and that's what he showed us. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. And, you know, and that's the hardest part about. Show. That's the hardest part about becoming organically certified. They have a bunch of rules in the back of their head, but they can't come in and say, oh, this is how your competition does it. This is how you should track it. They just stand back and go, what do you do to track it? And you, and so you had to come up with like ways to do it. Okay, we'll do it this way. And they're like, okay, that works. And but they don't help There's you. There's no guidelines. No guidelines. Yeah. They have guidelines that you have. They basically give you a big, <laughs> thick book and they say, read this. <laughs> 
fair trade and then the switch. A lot of companies don't, they, they might have one line that's fair trade or one line that's organic because it's very hard, very costly, um, all the audits, um, all the education, so much involved that they just don't do it. They don't do um, all of this stuff and they do one line. It's kind of deceiving because like, yeah, we're organic, fair trade, and, and but they'll have one coffee, that's it. So, and then. It works for them because they're but they could buy a really inexpensive bean and make all their money and then sell this to as a marketing gimmick. But all the big companies, they're not organic. Maybe, you, know, uh, you guys can all the top big companies, you can I don't have to use their name, but they're not organic. Who are some of your bigger customers? Unless that's a secret. No, no, no <laughs> secrets. No. Our our, our the most famous ones. Biggest supermarket right now is um, uh, Shaw's. Shaw's, yeah, 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 um, Big, Big Y, y Price Chopper, yeah, the supermarkets, it. small supermarkets, um, Days Market in Rhode Island, um, and then a lot of co-ops. Um, Harvard's probably our most famous. Most popular. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we sell we, a lot of colleges. MIT, Harvard, UNH. Dartmouth, we just picked up Amherst College, mm -hmm. Holyoke College. Um, we're really big in the Ivy League. Hampshire College. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, I think it's from growing up in Amherst. Yeah. 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 Hampshire College. It is. Um, Smith? Fitchburg. Not no, Smith, we, not we, we used to sell to the we museum to over there. Yeah. Um, there was a small cart in the museum. But you never know. Smith, they all talk. You know, Smith, they're all, they're all, they call Smith, Hampshire College. I mean, not Hampshire, Smith, uh, Mount Holyoke, Dartmouth. Um, Wesleyan. Um, not Wesleyan. Oh. Um, uh, Harvard, um, those are all um, uh, Holy Cross. They call those independents. So they have their own food food system. They don't hire out to. They don't contract out to a, another larger company like Airmark or Bon Appetit or Compass. Come in and just take over their food program and then charge them a fee and do everything. Mm -hmm. um, they do their own. So, so yeah, we've been working with Mount Holyoke for a long time. Um, and you that's win some when you lose some. You try not to get better out of shape by cause so. Too. They like what we do, so they recommend us that kind of stuff. But we also work with you know the, the bigger companies like Bone Appetit. This is a funny story though. When we when we were sitting at the table and stressing out, we we wrote uh, we were Mount Holyoke was like five miles from our house at the time, and we were writing um, please use our coffee, please use our coffee, and we we met with them and and we were we had a kiosk. No, we we knew about kiosks. And we want to put a kiosk there, and this gentleman Mark Garner wrote us this really nice long letter saying, geez, you guys have spirit, but uh, you, we can't work together. I, hopefully in the future, you never know. And uh, we now work with Mark Garner like 20 years later. And it's great because I was throwing files out one day and it just sort of popped out of this box. And I, I'm like, hey, Sean, this is from Mark Garner. And it was just sort of funny because now we're really good friends and we work with him really closely. But at the time, he was just giving us the punch in the shoulder, keep it up, guys, you get there kind of speech. <laughs> And he's been with Mount Holyoke for like 25 years, so he was just starting out with them when we were working with them. And we're um, um, kosher certified for um, Passover and I. Try to cover all the bases. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. I feel like we missed some stuff. This seems not really working out well. I know I missed some, mm -hmm. some slides, but any questions? I don't have time to answer. It's uh, 20 past seven. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I can't even tell you. We, we thought we were going to be talks, preaching to the chairs tonight. It was a nice surprise that people came out. We're just plugging your organization. How are you still getting along after yeah, all these uh, years? I'm that amazed. is funny. We didn't get along growing up, we couldn't stand each other. <laughs> I transferred from Colorado to Springfield College and he was going there and we'd be at parties and we'd be like, what's up? I was at <laughs> No, we played sports together. You know, he, I was the younger brother and he was two years older, so it wasn't cool to talk to me kind of thing. <laughs> but um, no, just the great thing about working with a partner is, as your brother, is I can't tell you how many times in our 
business where I would be, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm so burnt out. And he would be like, no, no, stick it in there. Come on. And there was times when he wanted to quit. And I was like, no, no, no. And when Sean started having kids, we really started getting serious. Up till then, it was just sort of like hanging out and, you know, fun. Um, we only had to worry about each other and Pretty much it. But we did work two jobs in the first dog, 10 years. I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah. the great thing about owning your own business is you usually work more than one job when you do it, at least to start out. Um, we call it sweat equity. We just work until see the end of the tunnel. Fake it till you make it. That's another <laughs> mantra of ours. I remember reading one of the sales book and the guy was like, I just bullshitted my way and then I looked around and I was at the top of my industry and I wasn't bullshitting anymore. And I'm like, so we've been telling people, fake it till you make it and no one knows the difference. And surround yourself with people who work with, you know, great to, who, we have great employees who all care and you know, we treat our employees very well and we get the same back and um, we treat it like a family um, and uh, um, getting along. Uh, what, we both have to know how to do everything and basically develop pretty much everything, but we split off. And so Darren runs the service department now, but we both do, do both if we have to, and I'm more running the sales, and um, we both do marketing together. I hate numbers. I the, um, puts me to sleep. And, I working with and Sean's, Hans, Sean's Hans Garvin, her husband's a fire, um, I think he's a fire sergeant. He's a assistant, assistant chief, I think. Um, but anyways, she works for us now. She's actually an accountant. She's great. but so. And then we have good salespeople. And, and, and our old employee, uh, you know, manager, our vice roaster. president was Mindy Isabel, and Chris Ethier was, was our landlord, father, yeah. and she ran our business for a long time. We, she was, she, it, only recently did she leave to, to take a, another job at Mount Holyoke. No, Holyoke. North no, no, Northfield Maharman. And I don't blame her, it's such a stressful business. And, she was with us for you know, 10 years, I think. It's funny, they say that throughout your life you do four or five different occupations or jobs as you get older and we've never done anything but this. And I always tell Sean, I'm like, I'd be the worst employee. I don't really know anything. I don't really do anything. Do they all drink coffee? Yeah. Most of them do. Have to ask. No, no, no it's actually, we, actually, we actually do, we start with coffee, do, we do a bunch of lines, we do a tea line. If you want, um, there's chocolate covered espresso beans over there we do. Yeah. Um, they're really good. And our father-in-law, my father-in-law came up with these spice rushes. It's phenomenal. But like I didn't run beer. We came out with, we were working with them. Yeah. Yeah. We're actually working with BBC right now. We'll meet with Gary next week, the owner, because he's he's developing our um, our nitro coffee class. Oh, yeah. so, yeah. Ice coffee yeah. in a keg and having cans. Yeah, it's really funny. We, we've been doing it for almost eight years. Yeah. We started making it in small kegs. We first introduced it at Harvard when we were working with um, the, we work in the, with the, a company that runs a cafe and the um, grad student library on Appian Way. And we've been working with them for almost eight years. Um, so we started it back then. Like we, we, we saw it online. It's so funny, one of our guys at, at Wesleyan who we've known forever, he's so neurotic, but he told us about it like 10 years ago. And so we uh, went online, Gary, it's a great thing, yeah, Gary. Gary. And it's the great thing about YouTube is you can see crazy things out there and a lot. And so we got ourselves uh, making it, experimenting it, and we, we would make these kegs and keg later and, and it's, it was the greatest thing in the world. And we really started to do it full speed ahead and then we started testing it in labs and being a cold process and not pasteurizing it can really get people sick. And you know, we pulled back and, and, and now we let other people make it for that reason alone. The great thing about BBC is they centrifuge it and they strain it and they pasteurize the water before it goes in and it's all a closed environment they and they have a lab the and they test everything and all the things we wanted to hear. <laughs> because we were just like, oh man, I don't want to get anybody sick. You know, the last thing you want to do. But you know, if you make it and you use it up within a week, no problem. Mm -hmm. If you make it and it sits around for a month and then you drink it, you could be in trouble. It's actually four months. Four months. <laughs> if you keep wow. But you learn as you go. And that's the great thing about life. You just learn as you go and you mm -hmm. ask a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, Sean is really good with handling stress, and I'm an emotional baby, and and so he's good at the sales and the numbers and the banks, and I'm good at my with my hands fixing things, and and I like that part of the job. But we both have to do it because right now Darren's heading up the construction part over at a new location. We're both involved in it, and working with a 
engineers and the contractors and you know all the blueprints, all that kind of stuff. But because he's he actually staying there, I'm taking over the service part of it. So I've been doing the setups and communicating and ordering equipment. And so we both can do both. You know, when it comes to sales, he can do sales. You know, um, but we both do marketing. So you know, we want we work with our marketing director, Mark. Is his name. I'm going to set this up actually, um, etc. So. You, you learn you have to know everything. Fixing equipment, we can fix any kind of piece of machinery if we That's have to. That's the greatest we thing We always bounce stuff off each other. We'd have called from some account. I'm like, Darren, what about, what do you think this is? Or whatever, what do you think that is? That's another mantra. When we first started working, we respected Pete and Dave so much. If we ran into an issue, we would, we would go, what would Pete and Dave do? And that would be, <laughs> we would literally talk it out. We'd be like, that's what they would do. Especially when you well, retail. Why, yeah, because they were so good with their, their like like bossing around their employees. Not not their employees, but you know what I mean. They're so good with people and and troubleshooting, and they have tough tough skin. They look like really out there hippies, but they're really business people and tough skin and smart. And so yeah, for so long we'd be well, like, Pete's funny. What would Pete and Dave do? The older brother, he finally got burnt out and said, "I'm done, done." And so Peter bought him out. And um, I remember seeing him working there like three or four. Years. He went back and got his degree in, in education and whatever. And he finally, he would come back to help uh, Pete out, Pete, Pete a break, and he's like, this is great. I can still manage and boss people around, but then I can leave. It's not my problem, <laughs> it's Pete. <laughs> That's hilarious. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions.